Today we welcome Juan Garcia Herreros to our studio in Berlin. And yeah, could you introduce yourself, maybe? You just introduced me, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm very happy to be here, yes. My name is Juan Garcia Herreros. And what, what do you do? Oof, <laughs> I wear many hats. I'm a producer, I'm a composer, I'm a bassist, musician, person trying to be a good human being. <laughs> um, many things, so many hats and uh, I guess I'm always in the pursuit of excellence. Heard you also try uh, or try to learn the tuba? <laughs> <laughs> trombone. Uh, tr oh, I was trombone, yeah. Exactly. Well, that's one of the results of, uh, of this of this crazy COVID time mm. where you have, you might have more time at home than you would touring. And I said, well, this is the perfect time to learn more instruments. Okay, now it basically took away one of my questions, but that's, that's okay. <laughs> no, we can pull it off later. <laughs> yeah. No so, um, you're also known under your stage name, The Snow Owl. Mm -hmm. And yeah, can you tell us something about that, where it comes from? Sure, or? sure. That's a, that's a common question, which is normal, yeah, uh, I understand. I, um, I have uh, Arawak uh, origins mm -hmm. from Colombia. And that's my indigenous name. So that's actually my birth name is uh, Snow Owl, Schneeule in German. Yeah. And uh, it's a very beautiful tradition to to know that that is your real given name mm -hmm. instead of the legal names that you get from governments. <laughs> yes, so that's the reason for it. Nice. And yeah, you're playing kind of a special bass. Mm -hmm. It's a six string mm -hmm. uh, custom made bass. Um, yeah, what's so special for you about about the bass? Why, yeah, why did you want it the way that it is? Basically, the the electric contrabass guitar is is how Anthony Jackson, he's the founder of this instrument, and I I started out playing piano and flute, but I fell in love with bass as well. And I thought, in which way could I fulfill both roles? Be harmonic, be melodic, be a bass player, all of that. And uh, the extended range from the contrabass uh, electric guitar um, sits perfect in, in, in a range where I feel the most comfortable in. So that's the reason for custom designing the instrument with very specific measurements, uh, lengths, everything. And um, thanks to Anthony Jackson, I was able to build one as well. Uh, just a stupid question mm -hmm. for myself. Uh, what's the difference between a regular e bass and an electric contrabass, or is there? When the when the contrabass guitar is built correctly, you have the exact uh, length of an upright piano. You see, ah. and especially on your lower your low yeah. B string, your low E string. So you need to have a certain amount of rotation and length to to get the sustain, the correct sustain for the instrument. The width between the and the spacing between the strings as well it's a it's a pretty big thing to handle but uh it's definitely worth the hassle <laughs> yeah you've been named the world's best bassist in 2019 sorry to bring that up <laughs> um but yeah i can imagine that felt amazing weird i don't know how that how did it feel it's uh, even to just be listed when the bass player magazine and the music reader uh, put their, their list of the top, top, top 20, just being listed was, was enough for me. It's enough of a blessing, of course. Um, finding out that, that I had won, I didn't believe it <laughs> because it was a voting thing from, from the audience. So it's the belief of the readers is the belief of the listeners and I can only say thank you for recognizing me and I will continue to give my best. Yeah, uh, can you tell us something about your audio setup uh, in general mm -hmm. and yeah also maybe why you were reaching out to us mm -hmm. and f yeah for the Raumzeit machine and the Cream RC for of example. What did you think, for example, mm -hmm. what, what, what sound were you looking for mm -hmm. or um, how did you want to, to improve your setup? Basically? Absolutely. 
Well, I've I've had the tremendous privilege over my over 20 year plus career so far to have worked in the top studios in the world. Uh, I've worked in LA and all the top studios in New York City, top studios, Vienna, Synchron Stage, uh, Paris, and London, Air Studios. I've been able to work in all of these places. And there's there's always a constant of choice of hardware, right? That the great studios have. And I always wondered, you know, there was a time where people, they didn't know Rupert Neve designs. There was a time where they, they didn't know the EMT place, where all these things were, were just starting out, right? And I always thought to myself, how amazing would that be to, be to be able to find a company that is innovative and thinking forward and designing great equipment, right? And I'm always looking for that. I'm always looking for what's new, what's the latest. And when I saw, I think it was on, on YouTube, I saw some videos, the demo videos of the RC, the Creme, Creme RC and the, the round side. I thought for the first time, wow, the gear that is in these studios is finally accessible to me. I don't have to be in those studios, plus the situation of COVID that we're in, that I have to do so much work remotely. It was time to look for, for equipment that was at that level. And for me, uh, when I received the, the round side from you and I put it in, it was, it was an instant gratification moment. I felt uh, that there was like a point of no return. I said, this is the exact reverb that I was looking for for mastering. This is, and creme as well. SSL boards, I've, I've worked on, I don't know how many bus compressors with the SSL bus compressor, even the plugins. And creme for me is doing even more than what the SSL is doing originally. I really, really enjoy the units. So it was very easy for me to reach out because the demo sounded great. And then having it hands-on in my studio is just uh, completely fulfilling. I got you right, you were, um, you were basically also looking, well, I think every artist was looking for a signature sound. Mm -hmm. Yes. So something that's that's you, basically your musical identity or mm -hmm. something. At least that's how I imagine this. This is how I want to sound. Yes. And yeah, was this also something where you could see, uh, yeah, basically our devices? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's, a, there's a point, there's a point in your, in your audio career. You start out learning the basics. You start out learning things that work. And there, there are things that they just work. You're gonna need your compression for your productions. You're gonna need your reverbs for your production. You're gonna need your EQs for your productions, right? And so many plugins and so many machines are fixed. They're not as flexible as you want them to be. There's, the, there's all the, there's all the glitter and 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 prestige about it, but uh, the hands-on approachability of the equipment um, it makes it very easy to find characters it makes it very easy to customize things so i think that was something that that was very attractive for me also the the fact that you can remote control them from anywhere in the studio because me having a dante network for my studio and having to reach out machines you know all over the place um, and just to see it on the plugin in the DAW in pro tools I mean, that, that's just a maximum luxury, you know. But the equipment, it just, it sounds great. It, I, I would even go further and say it feels great, you know. And you should be listening, not just looking at the gear for knobs. You should be listening to the gear. Yeah, it can be fun when they are moving <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, on their own. But yeah, if you just look at the knobs, you don't listen to the, yeah. what's, what they do, basically. Yeah, the um, next one is going to be a bit of a hard question. Okay. I'm sorry in advance. Okay. But um, can you summarize maybe some of the most important aspects of your work? Or, yeah, of your workflow, maybe? Of my workflow? And or, or my work? <laughs> yeah, there are two separate <laughs> questions. Let's see. I'll start with workflow. Yeah. I'll start with the workflow. Um, since I'm a composer as well. I'm a composer, I'm a performer, engineer, and producer. 
it's a it's an advantageous seat, uh, seat that I'm in because I know that when I'm composing something, I'm already thinking, okay, how I will be placing it in the mix, or I'll be thinking about um, which instrumentation or which choice of range or, or or which setup will I be, which microphone will go with this, with that. So I have it. I'm um, everything. I'm in a constant state of uh, preparation, prevention, and creativity. See those three right there. It's always how I need to prevent that the performance is not interrupted, that the creativity, that the flow of the energy, the, that the melodic intent is uh, kept. So the workflow, having the proper hardware, the correct instruments, the right musicians, or just the right uh, melody or inspiration, that should never be interrupted when you go to document it. So the workflow is one of having literally instruments next to microphones available at all times. Idea comes, go. And I'm not interrupted, I just go, I keep going. So it's one like that. And then the post, the post workflow is with the machines, of course, that I'm using. And um, post becomes for me more of a polishing than fixing. If you capture everything correctly in the way in, then on the way out, your work will be much easier. Don't take that in, but shit in, shit out. <laughs> <laughs> Basically. It's so true, it's so true, yeah. Mm, yeah, you already said something about COVID and lockdown. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for example, for me, myself, it was a rough time because uh, all my DJ gigs were cancelled. I, I couldn't do anything at all. Wow. Um, I s now I started to get in the studio more. Yeah. And I'm trying my first step, not my first steps, but I wouldn't say I'm doing okay there. But yeah, how, how did you keep your creativity flowing mm -hmm. during that time, which must be very difficult also for you as a performing artist, I think? Yes. Um, at first, there was a joke between us studio uh, nerds <laughs> that you know social distancing and we were like well that's what we do every day <laughs> we live we live socially distanced in a room you know creating uh, so at you know but that joke got old quick <laughs> yeah. um, I've been I've been tremendously blessed that people from all over the world especially during this COVID time have asked me can you record can you compose can you do this can you do that so I've been working all the time and just creating from a different perspective of that. Uh, unfortunately, the technology allows us to continue our work. The creativity is not a problem for me because an artist has to document the sound of his time. Therefore, COVID is a constant inspiration of adapting. And because of that, I'm constantly inspired of the stories that I hear or what I'm going through myself. And I love the fact that I was a stage performer for so many years, since I'm 17 years old. And I love the fact that, in a way, it was taken from all of us, you know, for, or it's on pause. And you have to ask yourself, then, who am I without the stage? And that, that is a beautiful moment because you, you find out who you really are and having that extra time for yourself or maybe extra time with your family, extra time with your pets, extra time with, with, with whatever it is that you enjoy, it identifies you. It, it defines you and things that I wanted to develop to a real deeper state as an artist, as a producer, as an engineer and as a human being Thanks to COVID, I was able to. You were also working on the recordings for the new Dune soundtrack uh, production. Yes. Yeah, I can imagine it was a bit, maybe, uh, yeah, it was exciting, maybe overwhelming when I think Hans Zimmer reached out to you and yes. was like, hey, do you want to do the recordings <laughs> <laughs> for this little film there? <laughs> Hans, uh, 
Hans Newell, I'm a big fan of the of the books. We we, we had talked about it before previously on the world of Hans Zimmer, and uh, his uh, his approach was so great because he thought you know when you hear Star Wars, uh, he he always questioned why do you hear uh, orchestra, you know this is supposed to be another planet. <laughs> why are we hearing strings and brass and all these things? You know this this is supposed to be uh, an alien world. So he wanted alien sounds, let's say, or things just to pull, uh, push the envelope like he always does. So I, I did about a hundred hours of just sound design of the craziest experiments, uh, the craziest things that he was asking me for, you know. I have one story which is really funny that uh, a friend of mine, I, I, he asked me for a Rickenbacker bass. He wanted me to, to basically beat it up with a stick <laughs> and do all these crazy things. And I called a friend and I was like, can I borrow your bass, you know? And he's like, for what? And I said, well, look, I have to beat it up for Hans Zimmer. And he was like, awesome. <laughs> he's like, go for it, do it, you know? So, um, but um, there was, I guess there was a sense of, of pressure because the, the expectations of the fans for this film were, were ginormous. But Hans, um, Hans's trust in me and also my trust in myself that I can give what he's asking for. There's such a trust there that it became a, a sonic journey. Basically, it it almost became a thing of what can we, what crazy thing can I do today? You know, it was like go downstairs in the studio and start and what what good can we try today? Let's try this, let's try that. And when it started to turn into music, see, first it was just sounds, sounds and this and that. When the moment it became music, that's the moment you start to hear Hans's vision. You know, that's the reason why Hans was asking for this, for this, for that, right? And the moment we finally started hearing the cues and working on the finished cues, seeing some of the images from the film, that was the big, ah, that's why. <laughs> that's why we're doing that. So it's an extremely beautiful journey. The, that, that particular project is something I'm the most proud of. And I also have to say, that uh, Hans's um, humongous generosity to use not only this film but many other films to employ as many musicians as he could to help him during COVID, and uh, I love him for that. Yeah, it's a nice. Uh, it's really great. Yes, I think you were during the the uh, yeah recording process mm -hmm. and sound sound design. You were using, I think I saw a video or something, mm -hmm. uh, where you were using kind of an unconventional recording <laughs> uh, method for your bass, where you put a microphone inside a big uh, plastic bottle <laughs> yes, or something. Yes, yes. Was, uh, I imagine this was to get more low end and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. something, yes. and, and the, the, the bottle vibrations or something that they... Yes, it's a fantastic uh, recording technique mm -hmm. the, that I learned from Jeff Foster in, in Air Studios. In London, and there is a, a, an omni microphone, you know, a condenser in, in in the bottle. You will, you will. There's so many vibrations that are reflecting off the floor as well, and they get trapped inside, you know. And for subwoofers for cinematic films, that's one of the best things to do. But you need your creme. <laughs> you have to control it. You have to control that, you know, big thing there. Uh -huh. But uh, yeah, that was an amazing technique. Yes, and and you have to push the envelope and don't be afraid to try crazy things, you know, that's the whole fun of it. Be a kid about it. Um, you're also doing game scoring, I think. Mm -hmm. yes. So um, for me, as someone who's not doing uh, game or music scoring, uh, game or movie, mm -hmm. yeah, movie scoring, um, is there much difference between them um, because I in in my view they are they could be quite similar for example you you have a scene and you need to bring emotion into that scene yes with the music yes whether it be joy or fear mm -hmm. or yeah whatever yes so yeah and is this different from from songwriting for example when you're when you're doing a soundtrack for a film the the script is finished, right? There's a 
certain length, there's a certain dynamic. Gaming allows you to be more, more extended. So you have, nowadays, the games are, are so intricate that the decisions you make in the game will change the story, right? So, and also the gameplay, you have to be extremely creative how to make a loop that the gamer will not be bored of after 1,000 times trying to defeat that boss or looking for that treasure chest in the forest or whatever. And you want to have it, uh, you have to have so many variations of the music, right? And th that's one thing I love the most about the gaming soundtracks is I might have an amazing idea and now I have to find 20 different ways to recreate that idea so that it never gets boring. And the great thing that I am so fascinated about right now is immersive audio, 360 ambisonics, Dolby Atmos, all the, the gamers with the VR sets and everything, immersive sound, binaural mixes, everything. That is, that is, we're no longer living in a stereo world anymore. And in order to create sound that is actually moving like real life, now we're, now we're not just capturing energy and performances, we are recreating life and environments and ambiences. And the gaming world allows that. And for a person who loves music and loves engineering, this is the best marriage for, for me of, of, of uh, the human experience. What do you have planned uh, in the near future? Um, mm. I think you have an yes. album in the making, the... The red, red road. Red road. Yeah. Yes. Before was the blue road. Yes, yes. No, it's the red road. The yeah. trilogy. Yeah. Exactly. The trilogy. No, there's there's a lot. There's a lot happening right now. Focusing right now, of course, on the Hans Zimmer Live tour. Yeah. Uh, that's going to be going out. I'm also still a part of uh, the world of Hans Zimmer. So, and these tours are are happening across the globe. In between all of that, my my uh, sound collective, Totem Warriors. We, that's where we do the soundtracks. We have uh, two very, very incredible projects that we're working on right now. I wish I could say the names, but because of NDAs, you have to be uh, discreet. Um, but there's two amazing soundtracks that we're working on. And of course, uh, the green light was given for the second Dune. So that will also be starting very, uh, I don't want to spoil too much, so I want to just stay quiet on that <laughs> before somebody <laughs> gets me in trouble. Um, and Don't be Tom Holland. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Poor guy. <laughs> um, so there's 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 a lot happening right now, which which I'm very excited about, and all the Snow Owl fans, uh, they will be too. So, I have a question. Uh, I read it that actually Hans reached out to you thanks to that video that he saw about your concert in Vienna playing Inception. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is super funny and. But I'm really interested, which is your vision of the social world right now? It's like you take it something from the social, you get in touch with dance. What do you want to give to the social now, like in terms of teaching, tutorial, YouTube, explaining gear, explaining your workflow? Do you think it's a way right now where people can learn music like easily or easily and in, in easily and with more easily access image when only the piano mm. was the instrument where people can learn music. Mm. It was expensive and maybe yes. so many people don't have the opportunity to try to do that and maybe we lost artists. Right now that you can afford a piano for 100 euro, yes. maybe if someone is creative, someone is good, can go you know, and become a musician. So do you think the social world, like video, that it could be Facebook, YouTube, everything, yeah. can give the same, the same approach of the of an EPN, so give more opportunity? Mm -hmm. What is your uh, idea? Absolutely, I understand absolutely. Um, I being born at, at a period before social media, of course, um, I have to appreciate the master-pupil relationship, which is it's so important to, to, to have the trust between a teacher and a student in person. That is, that is that's priceless. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a musical parent. At the same time, you have 
what they call YouTube University. <laughs> and I mean, I am so grateful that I can, I can research anything, any topic, uh, and really some of the craziest uh, negative harmony. That's, you know, that's, you can just study negative harmonies. You can study string theory, calculus, anything on YouTube, right? That is also amazing, but at the same time, everything is flooded. It's too much information. So how do you find the balance? You see, I agree and I love with, I'm an advocate for access to information, right? Where I disagree with it is, do not let the information dictate who you are. That's just one perspective that you're getting. Do not fix yourself on, oh, this is what I saw on YouTube and that's how it is. And the social media is meant to connect us. And when people are not talking to each other on a table anymore because they're on the social media, you're, you're more disconnected than you are connected, right? In the terms of music, it's a, it's a great honor to, I can watch uh, great guitarists from Brazil, I can watch koto players from, from Japan, I can, I can see seminars about taikos or, or gamelan in Indonesia. This is, this is amazing, I'm spoiled. But I'm, I'm, I'm a researcher, right? A person that, I'm, I'm a focused researcher. I know what I'm looking for. A person without direction, and this is where I believe the master has to help the pupil, is to give direction. So both have to happen, but some form of direction and some form of balance has to be included in this social media uh, cloud that we're in now. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah. If you're just starting out and you don't know what to search, exactly, all the information doesn't help you. It does not help because it's yeah. yeah. And it, and and also maybe to finish off on that is, uh, don't be afraid to ask questions. That I mean, it, the the dumb person in the room that asks the questions is the one that ends up being the smartest. Yeah.